Hello and welcome everyone who, who's joining us today for, for this webinar and also who, who will see the, the recording later. My name is Federico Fernandez. I am a senior fellow with the Austrian Economic Center and I'm also president of Fundación Internacional Bases, the, the two organizations that, that are uh, well, organizing, sorry for the, being redundant, this, this event. We're very happy to have Professor Betke with us and we're very happy also to have my, my dear colleague Simon Sarebsky from the AEC as, as interviewer for, for, this, for this event. I want to make a few quick remarks before we start and before I, I, I leave the floor to both Simon and, and Professor Betke. Uh, firstly, I mean, Simon will introduce Professor Betke in a, in a more formal way, even though I mean, I suppose everyone who's watching this knows him. But just you know, say I wanted to say that we're very honored and happy to to have him with, with us. It's it's great that that he's giving us a, a little bit of, of his time to to discuss about Austrian economics. That's the topic of, of today. And and in a way, uh, Professor Betke is a, a synonym of Austrian economics. There are probably very few people who have done so much to. Uh, advanced Austrian economics in the last half a century than uh, Professor Betke, so we're really happy and honored to have him. He's not only someone who, who has, let's say, made very deep uh, theoretical contributions, but he's also he has also popularized the message. He was featured some time ago at the Wall Street Journal, just to give you an idea because of, of his work, so we're very happy to, to have him. By the way, I'll put the links on the on the chat box as soon as I as I finish. But I wanted to mention by the two two books by uh, Professor Betke. The first one is is written by himself. It's on on F. A. Hayek, Economics, Political Economy, and Social Philosophy. And the other one is co-authored by Alex Salter, who is a, a, a great friend of Fundación Bases and of uh, Austrian Economics of the Austrian Economic Center, and Daniel Smith. The second one is uh, money and the rule of law. I'll put the links to, to both. I'm, I'm sure, I mean, if you enjoy this conversation, I'm sure you, I'm sure you will enjoy that, uh, those books as well. And last but not least, a little bit more of, of propaganda. We want, as you can see, the, the frame that we are in uh, right now, we want to invite you November the 3rd to November the 5th this year, in a couple of months, we are organizing an in-person offline conference in Vienna, in Austria. Vienna is like the cathedral of Austrian economics. It's the place where it all began. And we really want to, let's say, also put our efforts in order to bring the real normality back, not the new normal, but the real normality. We feel that we need to have face-to-face -face conversations. We need to gather and we need to, let's say, discuss the, the things that we that we care about. And well, Austrian economics is, is one of them. We have great keynote speakers, Hannes Gisurarsson, Jeff Booth, Agnieszka Ponka, and Mark Skousen. And we also still have for 19 days a call for papers open. The, the call for papers uh, will close on September the 19th. You can send the paper. You still can send the paper and if our academic committee uh, approves it, you can come in and, and present it at our conference. We'll have lots of special events. We'll have a pre-conference in order to socialize, to network. We're going to privilege networking uh, activities, which because it's something that we have lacked the last 18 months. And you can find all the information at our website, austrianconference.org. You can also hit me on, on social media or write either to Fundacion Bases or Austrian Center also on social media or send us an email and we'll be very happy to have you. Without further ado, I leave the floor to, to Simon and to uh, Peter Betke and I'm looking forward to, to their conversation. Thank you very much. Um, as Federico said, uh, Professor Betke is one of the most distinguished scholars in the Austrian tradition. He is a professor of economics and philosophy at the George Mason University, a BBNT uh, professor for the study of capitalism, and the director of the, again, prestigious FHI program for advanced study in philosophy and politics and economics at the Mercado Center, again at GMU. Welcome, Professor. It's a pleasure. Well, Simon, thank you very much. I, I, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. 
Well, as, as the title says, we are we are going to talk about Austrian economics in the world, real world and the applications. But what is economics first and foremost? I think it's very important, especially since you use the word mainland economics instead of mainstream economics. So what is economics and why do you use the mainline um, word? Yeah, I, well, I think if I can answer your first question first, then I'll explain the, the <laughs> second one, which is, You know, I think that, uh, you know, economics is a tool for the curious. And so what we want to do is excite people to look out the window to see the fascinating activities that are going on out in the world, not on the blackboard, not in a textbook, but actually literally out in the world. And what we then use is economic theory helps us. It's a set of eyeglasses that allow us to see when we look out into the world to be able to uh, unlock those mysteries that are out there. And I think the simplest way to think about that is that, you know, we live in a world of scarcity. That scarcity requires that we make trade-offs uh, precisely because we're, you know, making trade-offs and, and it's difficult to make those trade-offs. We need tools or aids to the human mind to make those trade-offs. And, uh, you know, in order to do that in a commercial society, we rely on property prices and profit and loss. And so we use property incentivizes us, pro uh, prices guide us, profits lure us and losses discipline us. And in the, in the context of a commercial society, that helps us sort of be able to negotiate the trade-offs because there are no solutions. There's only trade-offs that we face. And when we move into other environments, let's say politics, or if we move into traditional societies or whatever, we're going to find some mechanisms to help negotiate trade-offs that are different from property prices and profit and loss. And it has systematic effects. And none of the stuff that I just said is uniquely Austrian or uniquely, you know, whatever. It's just common sense applied to understanding the world that we live in and that individuals engage in choices against constraints. Now, mainline economics or where we've learned at those set of eyeglasses that allow us to understand these trade-offs and the mysteries out there in the world, that comes a long tradition of, of, of evolution of a scholarly and scientific body of thought that has certain wisdoms embedded in it. Like for example, the role of property rights, which was recognized by Aristotle in his critique of Plato, or the role of prices, um, or the role of profits, and or the role of losses, you know, the different people over time. And so, you know, Adam Smith put forth this idea, and I'll wrap this up in two seconds here, but Adam Smith put forth this idea that there was an invisible hand proposition, that, uh, and, and the best way to, to capture that is in the beginning of the Wealth of Nations, his discussion of the common woolen coat, how the common woolen coat ends up on the back of the day laborer. And he says, you know, observe how this happens. And he explains the extensive division of labor, none of which is under central command, but individuals pursuing their own self-interest um, are led to promote the interest of the overall order at a greater extent than even their own private interests. And that invisible hand proposition derived from the self-interest postulate happens only because of the institutions of property, contract, and consent. Smith never said individual self-interest, no matter what institutional environment, will produce a socially desirable outcome. All you have to do is look at his discussion of professors in, in Glasgow versus professors in Oxford. All right. The professors in Glasgow operated under a system in which they were paid by student fees. The professors in Oxford were paid by an endowment. The professors in they were both homo professor nomicus. Right. But the professors in, in Glasgow behaved differently than the professors in, uh, in, 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 in Oxford. And so this this idea that you derive the invisible hand from the rational choice postulate via institutions is critical to mainline economics. And it's, a, it's, it's that style of thought that one finds in you know, Smith, one finds in Mill, one finds in Menger, 
from Bavrik, Knight, Mises, uh, you know, Hayek, and to the modern, more, more recent times, you know, Buchanan, uh, Eleanor Ostrom, Doug North, Vernon Smith. And so you can drive a line between, in, in terms of this core proposition of economics, from Adam Smith all the way up to Vernon Smith. But along that line, there's always been people who deviated and disagreed with that position. So, you know, you have Malthus and you have Marx and then you have, you know, um, you know, someone like Veblen. And then, you, you know, later on you have Keynes or, you know, uh, more modern uh, renditions like Joe Stiglitz. Um, and so what mainstream refers to is what's scientifically fashionable. So at any certain time, the main line is the mainstream or the main line is deviates from the mainstream. And when the main line, my hypothesis is that when the main line, when the mainstream deviates significantly from the main line, schools of thought rise up to emphasize aspects of the main line to try to bring the scientific consensus back to that. And so that's why you see things like property rights economics, or you see things like public choice economics or law and economics. They're trying to bring the economic conversation back to the line of scholarly inquiry that was initiated by Adam Smith. And the Austrian school plays a particularly important role in that main line because the Austrians were, for one, educated within a law school, so they never did institutionalist economics. Uh, the Austrians were the founders of neoclassical economics, so they articulated and refined the idea of decision making on the margin, uh, choice against constraints in a world of uncertainty. They emphasize the idea of time in the time, you know, in which production and exchange activity takes place. And they recognize the complex coordination involved in social cooperation under the division of labor. And so as a result, the Austrians are like the modern developers of the Smithian agenda in its most refined form. And we have to then build off the writings of Menger and Mises and Hayek in order for us to go forward in our science. And that means that we have to reclaim the main line to be, you know, uh, this, this coherent body of thought that's continually refining and advancing, but then build off the most advanced statements of that, which, you know, is built in my, my uh, judgment is built by, you know, Mises and, and Hayek in particular, and then go forward with that. But sorry for that long with it answer, but that sort of lays out the basic idea of what mainline economics is and its difference from mainstream. So mainline economics just to summarize is a set of propositions, whereas mainstream is a sociological characterization of what's currently fashionable within the economics profession. And I want us to be more concerned, not with fashion, but with the core propositions of what the science of economics teaches us. Um. Before we go, go into the next question, don't forget that you can ask your questions on our YouTube uh, um, YouTube live at the Austrian Economic Center or the Fundacion Bases uh, on Facebook. Yeah. So I was going to ask you how do <clears throat> Austrian economics enter the fray with, within uh, within the mainstream, uh, with, within the main line, uh, but you kind of answered that. So I will, I will then ask... Um, what are the failings that the Austrian, uh, the Austrian scholars have, have done throughout history or even today that deviate from the main, main line or sometimes maybe deviated from the what we now would call true for knowledge? So where are the biggest errors that Austrians have made? Yes. Oh, well, that's a, that's a great question, actually. Uh, so thank you for asking it. Um, I do think that... Um, there's sociological mistakes that people have made, and then there's core analytical mistakes. Um, so let me start first with the sociological, and then I'll ask the more difficult question, which is at the core. So sociologically, um, and that is with the science, is that uh, the Austrian school has made mistakes primarily 
um, in the American phase of that. Uh, so as the Austrian school transferred from, because of having to leave Europe and the European context and coming to the United States and not recognizing in many ways what it meant to be professionally engaged in the scientific profession post-World War II. All right, that's, so, you know, the success of the Austrian Austrians, like, you know, forget Hayek and Mises, but also then think of Morgenstern, Machla, Nobler, Schumpeter. Uh, these Austrian Austrians made major contributions and they fit into the American academic scene very quickly. But the younger generation of, of Austrians in many ways um, got confused and they, they it, it sociologically, and they misunderstood what it was like to actually build a scientific career in, in modern academia. Now, the reason for that is twofold, maybe threefold, but let's just start with two, which is that the scientific professional consensus had so moved away from the main line due to Keynesian hegemony. So the Keynesian hegemony combined, so that's excessive aggregation combined with excessive formalism made the, the ability of the younger Austrians, the American Austrians to be able to enter into the conversation. And the second one was their heroes existed in a different intellectual context. So they were book writers, but the profession had become journal writers. They uh, wrote to the general public, but the profession had become specialized and, and, and focused on the scientific community. And so the very thing that made the Austrians survive during in the American scene during its lowest point, which is that they always had a lay audience that they could turn to, was also the thing that created a problem. And in my opinion, in modern times, it's gotten worse with the Internet <laughs> in many ways. Uh, um, so that those are those are the sociological things that I would say we're still grappling with and we're still trying to figure out, like, how can you use these modern tools of social media, like even today, to advance a scientific scholarly body of thought? And then how do you translate that into a popular understanding of economic literacy so that you can have a more rational policy conversation? But. You're asking a deeper question, which is where did the Austrians go wrong um, at, an analytic, at a methodological analytical level, which I think is a great scientific question. And I think there are eras, for example, Schumpeter, who was an amazingly talented individual, became too enamored with neoclassical Valrasian economics. And as a result, he thought he could sort of fit Austrian ideas, let's say the entrepreneur and creative destruction, with inside of a Laurasian framework, all right? And then that is not a coherent project. So Schumpeter can actually have an impact. You can get wisdom from Schumpeter, but you don't have the same kind of scientific building onto that project that you would had he had a more coherent project. Uh, you know, Hayek didn't review Keynes's general theory, huge error. Right. Hayek should have decided to review and take on Keynes's general theory. And instead, he went into developing uh, the pure theory of capital. But what he did in the pure theory of capital was, again, in the first uh, the, vo the volume that we have, he's basically making the same kind of error Schumpeter made, which he's trying to fit Austrian notions of a time structure production and heterogeneous and multi-specific goods into an equilibrium framework. And then he wants to introduce money in a second volume, which of course he never writes because he can't fit money into that framework, right? And so these are technical problems that until you break out of the, what Rothbart refers to breaking out of the Valrasian box, unless you break out of the Valrasian box, you're not gonna be able to make the kind of advancements with regard to time, with regard to money, with regard to process analysis, that the Austrian uh, approach pushes you to do. And, and so I think that that's still remaining for younger Austrians to pick up that project and run with it and go with it. Yeah. Well, we, we, you just explained like where, where the Austrians go wrong, but what about, what about predictions, for example, because 
the, the new classical, the modern approach to economics is you combine uh, you combine variables, you create a system, and then you do the predictions. Austrians are extremely against doing predictions, which when you look look at in the public uh, in the public policy realm, that's why no one is interested in what they have to say because they don't provide solutions. So why is that, and is that a problem? But remember, first of all, remember my first point, which is there are no solutions. There's only trade-offs. The Austrians don't provide point predictions, but they do provide pattern predictions. Okay, so you know Austrian economics does is able to provide pattern predictions. We uh, we are practicing a science of complex phenomena, not a science of simple phenomena. So as a result, we have to understand what that entails. Um, I think for your listeners, the best thing to read is to go back and read Hayek's Nobel Laureate Address, um, because uh, it's it's extremely poignant on this issue. Because this is the steps of the argument. So Hayek gets gets a Nobel Prize. He shows up. He has to give a toast. On the toast, he says, "You know." If I was asked whether or not we should give a Nobel Prize to economists, I would say no, because no economist should have this sort of prestige associated with their position. Thank you. Toast. Okay. Then he goes the next day and he has to give his lecture. And so he starts out his lecture. He says, point one, we have to admit economists have made a mess of things. This is in the middle 70s. So we're dealing with stagflation. So high levels of unemployment, high levels of inflation, which the Keynesian hegemony had predicted could never happen. It's right in your face. It's happening. OK, so that's one. Two, why did they make a mess of things? They made a mess of things, not because like what you're saying, they got the prediction wrong or something like that. Hayek goes deeper and he says they made a mess of things because they had a false view about what science is. He goes right at their right at their, their, the thing that justifies them claiming that they should be prestigious and on a pedestal. They have a false view of science. That false view of science puts the economist in a position to try to do a science which it cannot do, right? It's trying to make a complex science of complex phenomena behave the way a science of simple phenomena would behave. Because we're in a position where we're trying to do that, to pretend that we're achieving it puts us at the edge of being charlatans. These are my, not my words. These are Hayek words. And the edge of being charlatans. And as a result, we end up by losing the scientific status of our discipline of what it could have if it practiced science correctly. As a result of being charlatans, and still, you know, going along with that, we, we put ourselves at the edge of becoming tyrants to our fellow citizens and destroyers of the very civilization of which we benefit from. Again, Hayek says this in, what, six or eight pages in the pretense of knowledge. It is not a criticism of socialism. This is the biggest mistake people make. They read it and they go, oh, Hayek had this knowledge problem. His, his Nobel address is called the pretense of knowledge. It must be a criticism of socialism. It's a criticism of practice of standard economics. Standard economics suffers from a pretense of knowledge. And that same theme, by the way, is in also the Nobel addresses of Buchanan, who in the first paragraph says economists must cease pro-offering advice as if to a benevolent despot. And also in Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize, where at the end of the Nobel Prize, uh, you know, she makes a, a point about that we need to see like citizens rather than see like a state. And we need to reject this, the myopic view of seeing like a state as what economics is up to and instead empower self-governing capacity of individuals within the economy. And by the way, that's also an Adam Smith. The paragraph after the passage saying the invisible hand, challenge all your listeners to look it up. The passage after the invisible hand passage says that no Senate or lawgiver will have the unique knowledge to decide how to invest your capitals. And it would be nowhere as dangerous as in a man who thought 
that he had the ability to do that. That's in Adam Smith. That same message continues through all the way up through Hayek and then into Buchanan, into the Ostroms, into Vernon Smith. And this is what I mean by this sort of main line of economics. Main line of economics teaches us a humility. Uh, a, it teaches us about understanding the complex coordination that's required in the, in the vast division of labor that makes up the great society. And so this is what we're trying to understand, trying to treat it as if we uh, all choice is, you know, smooth and continuous and twice differentiable, right? Is it, it, it gives us precision, but it's a false precision. And that's the problem of modern economics is false precision. So we, you, you are, if I'm understanding correctly, you're not saying that the models are correct, but the whole uh, way of doing the models is correct. Uh, in, incorrect, pardon. We all theorize, and theorizing requires, uh, you know, being um, uh, abstract. We abstract from things. But there's a difference between abstracting and being unrealistic and abstracting and being realistic in your abstractions. So it's one thing to try to isolate, let's say, the entrepreneurial act and focus on the idea of alertness to an opportunity, all right? That there's, you know, I'm gonna buy low and sell high and I see that opportunity and I isolate that and then I say, the essence of entrepreneurship is in the recognition or the alertness to that opportunity. That's abstracting from like the complexity of the situation, but it's not unrealistic. So uh, if, if I, I know that my answers are somewhat long-winded here, but let me just try to, explain how I see it and then you can maybe react is that from Adam Smith until John Stuart Mill economists were concerned with developing logically sound theory logically sound theory which meant that if your uh, premises are true and your deductions are correct your conclusions are true okay economists were debating a lot all right. Not that they don't debate now, but the belief was is that they were engaged in endless debates. And so they thought the solution was or the problem was, is that we use the same words to mean different things and different words to mean the same thing. So this ambiguity in our thought creates the grounds for these endless debates. So why not get rid of the source of the ambiguity, which is natural language? And instead, what we're going to do is substitute a formal language, let's say 17th century calculus, is going to allow us to be able to model uh, these ideas. And so we're going to do that. And when we do that, though, we give up the quest for logical soundness. And now our theories are only logically valid. That's all we can know is whether or not we have logically valid models. Of, of the, of, of, and it gives license to unrealism because we're just trying to develop an internally coherent model, logically valid, not necessarily corresponding to anything in the world. But we economists, we care about the world, right? That's what we're supposed to be studying, right? Indust patterns of industrial development, unemployment rates, inflation, uh, these kind of things. This is what we're supposed to be studying. So we're gonna develop advanced statistical techniques that are gonna then sort from among the array of logically valid models, those which are, econ are, are empirically meaningful, right? You with me? This is, the, this is the standard model. The problem with that is what's called the Duhem-Quine thesis, so, which was developed to study physics and the problem in the, in the testing procedures in physics, which is that even in physics, which is isolated, controlled experiments, they couldn't determine whether or not the test was they couldn't determine that tests were unambiguous because a, a critical test could be in fact proving that the conclusions were in fact wrong or in fact proving that maybe one of the procedures in the steps was wrong or whatever. And so we, we ended up by not being able to have the unambiguous sorting mechanism. So in economics, what we did was we developed these little toy economies and we have an infinite variety of logically valid toy economies. And then we have statistical testing going on over here. And then the, the, the game was to see whether or not the statistical tests could cut against the array of logically valid models.
But if the tests are ambiguous, we have no sorting mechanism. So as a result, we just get stuck with the, lo the, the logically you know, valid toy economies floating around and none of them getting weeded out. And so this is what's led to the modern position which we're in, which is what I refer to in some of my writings as what I call formalistic historicism. So rather than the old style German historicism, we now have formalistic historicism, which is I can prove any damn thing I want in my model and I don't ever get it sorted out by empirical investigation. And I think also the idea that empirical investigation, the sum result of that is, is large and statistical approaches is simply not exhausting of doing empirical research. We all want to do applied and empirical research, but that also implies doing history, doing social histories, you know, teaching, learning about the social conditions of people other than the kings and the queens, right? Seeing how everyday people. So to me, the best that economics can offer is when it does the political economy of everyday life rather than the political economy of like what happens inside Congress, right? That, who, you know, and that's not what matters is what happens to people on the street. How is their lives live? Um, you know, and, and that kind of study and statistical approaches, while not, I'm not rejecting them as empirical part. I reject them as their ability to test a theory. I don't think that's how you test theories. And I also think that not the only way you can do empirical social science. They're one way, but not the only way. And so we have a very strong battle to fight methodologically, analytically, and yes, ideologically in the current social science array. To, to what you're saying, I will mention the Carden Kruger example from the 90s with a minimum wage. And as Gary Becker used to say, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. That's what basically they did in the 90s. And my guess is probably even the Austrians, when they want to prove something, they do they they do the same thing. They torture the data. And one of my one of my one of my professors was a man named Kenneth Bolding. And he's a great economist, second John Bates Clark Medal winner, and he used to say that we would do much better if we published people's waste baskets because they yeah. throw they throw yeah. the bad results out, and so we don't learn from that. So yeah, I mean. Look, we just saw an evidence of this with behavioral economics, right? So Dan Ariely's, you know, work on uh, is now being exposed to having some problems in it. We don't have very good replication rates in economics uh, in terms of our studies. Neither, by the way, do social psychology. Uh, so the social sciences have some real issues with data replication, uh, data analysis replication, um, uh, and learning from our failures. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, yeah, anyway, I mean, there's just a lot for us to engage in, but you have to actually have technical knowledge to be able to, to engage in that. So, you know, you have to understand statistics to be able to read and, and criticize statistical work. You have to be able to uh, work through models to be able to read and criticize those uh, uh, approaches to theory. So, well, you, you 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 sort of mentioned mentioned the um, the problems and but when did we go wrong? Like as a as a, as a science, was it with Marshall and uh, Walras in the late eighteen hundreds, or was it with maybe Keynes? Where where <laughs> when did we go wrong? So I'm laughing a little bit because I'm I'm like you know I have my own biases in all this, right? So uh, and and so you're gonna hear, but I think the real problem is uh, lies with Keynes, uh, actually. And the reason is, is because of the excess of aggregation. So when you unmoored economics from decision-making of individuals and thought that you were just studying, you know, correlations between aggregate variables, that's when it all went south. Hello? There we go. <laughs> Hello, Professor. I think we lost Simon. Um, it with my answer, with my answer, because I was given too long-winded answers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, well, I was just. Uh, let's hope he he can uh, come back with with us in a, in a minute. Yeah. So uh, there he is. Sorry. Simone. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, didn't like my, you didn't like my answer about canes. Uh, I so, gave him the wrong button. <laughs> yeah. So when I uh, uh, when I wrote my book, Living Economics, um, the if you go to the the very first uh, chapter in that book and the uh, the first paragraph, it says. John Maynard Keynes was wrong in 1936. Uh, John Maynard Keynes was wrong in 1956. John Maynard Keynes will be wrong in like, you know, whatever, 2056. Just John Maynard Keynes was just wrong. And 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 so the 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 uh, you know, the publisher wrote to me and said, you know, one of the editors said, "Don't you want to say something different because this might turn readers off?" And I was like, no, this is what I want to say. <laughs> so I, I understand my own, uh, you know, sort of biases on this. I, 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 I think that in Marshall, there is some real serious shortcomings, uh, you know, but there also is a lot of promise in that. I think that, uh, you know, uh, Pareto is better than uh, Valras. Um But even in, 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 but even if you think about Valrasians, like say, for example, Enrico Baroni, if you read what Enrico Baroni is doing, he actually is trying to demonstrate, like Pareto did, that um, achieves every day what the rarefied model would achieve only under very specific conditions. And so I think there's still scope within that early neoclassical economics for the development of mainline economics. But once you get to Keynes, mainline economics is lost and mainstream economics under Samuelson becomes something different. And so that, so Keynes sets the ball in motion. Samuelson is who locks it in because Samuelson was uniquely talented, brilliant man, uniquely talented. And what he did was he controlled the principal's market and the graduate school market. And he did that for over a generation. And that has changed the way economics was done. All those economists trained in that period from 1950 to 1970 were trained basically in Samuelsonian economics. And then you start from that and then you have to scratch your way back to the main line of economics. So just do a thought experiment. Imagine in 1940, late 1940s, Rather than economists becoming enamored with foundations of economic analysis, they became enamored with human action, right? One book came out from Harvard in 1947. The other book came out from Yale in 1949, you know, right? We have a competition. They imagine we're, we're at this point here at the beginning of the competition. Well, what happens is all those resources, intellectual, financial, uh, political, were thrown into the Samuelsonian project. And very little resources were thrown into the Misesian project. And so the Misesian project has Hayek, it has, you know, Kersner, it has Rothbart, but pretty much it's truncated, you know, there, whereas the other project has like all these people working on it. And what if it leads to a dead end? Well, then what you have to do is go all the way back to 1949 and trace back out again. And that's a very difficult project. So that's I, what went wrong. I was going to ask you uh, this, especially like we speak about Austrian, Austrian school, again, especially you, but in academia, Austrian school is like forgotten. If you remember back in the days when Bob Murphy was about, wanted to have a debate with Paul Krugman, Paul Krugman, you know, uh, winning Nobel Prize recently said like, oh, who are those Austrians? They were important back in the 1920s, but they don't exist now. And he's like on top of, let's say, academia. Yeah. So I don't think that that's a true representation. Uh, I, I, I agree with you that the Austrian school uh, is considered a minority group, right? Um, and, and highly dubious, methodologically, analytically, and then ideologically. But it's also the case that different Austrians have been able to be part of the mainstream conversation in a variety of ways. So, for example, Israel Kirzner was published his book was University of Chicago. He uh, was invited by the profession 
to uh, you know write a survey article on the Austrian School of Economics for the leading survey magazine, you know, journal, scientific journal for the economics profession, the, the Journal of Economic Literature. Um, he has won distinguished awards, the top entrepreneurship scholar, the distinguished fellow of, of various societies and whatnot. So Kersner, who no one can question is a devoted Austrian, is in fact someone who's been part of the mainstream conversation, though a minority voice in the mainstream conversation. I would say the same thing for Mario Rizzo, that you know Mario Rizzo's most recent book on escaping paternalism takes behavioral economics head on. It's published by Cambridge University Press. It has gotten wide scale recognition such that the leading behavioralists feel that they have to respond to it, like Cass Sunstein and other people like that. Yeah. Uh, earlier period of time, Don Lavoie, Rivalry and Central Planning, Cambridge University Press book, had, you know, Yanis Kornai, you know, responding to it, you know, and, and the leading people in comparative economics. So it just depends on the kind of personality and talents of the people. But one of the reasons why, and again, you know, Bob Murphy is a, is a very unique talent in many ways. Like he just was on, you know, Jordan Peterson and he has a huge yeah. reach and he was able to you know, uh, you know, have a, a a cruise in which people like paid to go see him talk and everything like that. But Bob is not an academic economist. He chose to do a different kind of route. He went into a non the non scholarly, non scientific route, and instead worked in the field as a public economist, public intellectual economist. Yeah. Right. And so my teacher Hans Senholz was similarly. He was a public intellectual economist before the age of the internet. So he didn't have the tools that Bob had to make his ideas thing, but he wrote popular columns. He gave speeches, you know, that's what he did. But what he didn't do was be at the AEA meetings every year or try to get in the, in the, the top, you know, scientific journals or, you know, his citation pattern, you know, so, and, and all this stuff again, you know, it's, it's, it's not, you don't look at citations just for the sake of looking at citations. That's, you know, cargo cult science or whatever. You don't want to do that. But there is a scientific professional conversation. There's a public conversation. And then there's a political conversation. And economists choose to be in one of those three conversations. And so, you know, the political conversation is if like you go and work at, you know, at, at the, uh, the Council of Economic Advisors or your work in the, you know, one of the congressional staffs, like on banking or whatever, you know, and and then there's a public conversation, which is just like Henry Hazlitt. You try to bring economic literacy to the to the masses. Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, Bob Murphy is in that sort of you know ground. And then you have your scientific conversation, in which people are trying to talk to other professional economists and raise their hand in the scientific contribute con conversation and simply make their point and enter into that. And we wear our different hats at different times. Right. So, yeah, you know, when we teach undergraduates, we're mainly being public intellectuals. Right. We're, we're, we're you know, you know, you could, right. When we teach graduate students, we're trying to be scientific peers. When we're doing policy, writing a policy paper for, you know, Cato or whoever, a white paper, let's say Cato or Brookings or AEI or whoever, then we're being a policy economist. And so, you know, depending on where you find yourself, what I would say is that Krugman, when he says they're nobody, he's referring to the fact that there's not as many voices over here in the scientific conversation. And so why the hell should he punch downward? Because there's a strict pecking order, yeah. right? In the science, the, the, the scientific contributions are the ones that have the higher prestige. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, then probably the policy economists are the next ones and the public intellectuals are the, la are the last ones. Because like if I'm, a, if I'm a central banker, if I'm Larry Summers, the fact that I go from being Larry Summers, the economist that's making contributions to our understanding of macroeconomics to Larry Summers, the policy economist, that's a lot more prestigious than Larry Summers, the guy who writes op-eds in the New York Times, right? Uh, right? And so, you know, it, it just, so why is Krugman going to punch downward is his claim. 
right? That that's what he's trying to get at there. But he, you know, he's he misstates a lot. So for example, he has he he take I'm talking about Krugman now. He <laughs> takes, he takes shots at Friedman, you know, in, in, in the yeah. most in, in this most recent book by Wapshot called Samuelson Friedman. One of the most stark claims that Wapshot makes. Wapshot wrote an earlier book called uh, Keynes Hyatt, right? So now he has a new book called Samuelson Friedman. And one of the most striking claims he makes in that book is that Friedman did not have the scientific influence. He only had a political and popular influence, not scientific influence. And that's a hard thing to, to wrap your head around because in 1968, Friedman's presidential address to the AEAs is the signal of the victory of monetarism over Keynesianism. All right. But Wapshot doesn't, is not recognizing any of that. And he's focused just on the Newsweek columns. So he's, he's focused on Friedman as a public pugilist rather than Friedman, yeah. the scientific economist that changed the way the economics profession thought about the relationship between money and the economy. You know, just when I was in graduate school, there was two t-shirts that floated around. One of them was a picture of a youthful Hayek. And it said, I was 25 years old when I wrote monetary theory in the trade cycle. How old, what have you done? Right. Or something like that. Cause you know, all of us, when you're in graduate school, you're 25 years old, you know? And, and so there's this picture. The other one was a little picture of Friedman and it said with this equation, I have conquered. And it was, you know, MV equals P2, yeah. right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and those things circulated around and they weren't just at, at where I was in graduate school. They were everywhere, you know, um, cause people were still talking about the breakdown of the Keynesian hegemony and, how we were going to redo economics based on new classical macroeconomics. And so that was the excitement kind of of the time. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Austrians are a, so just this last semester, um, I was able to give talks at, uh, I mean, I understand that uh, it's the internet, you know, and, and zoom talks. So it, but, I was invited to give talks at the uh, Stanford University, grad, uh, the Grad School of Business, the London School of Economics. I gave the Spinoza lecture at the London School of Economics, and I also gave a talk at NYU. OK, so Stanford, LSE and NYU, they are very mainstream places. All right. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, so people can be part of that conversation. It's not a conversation that um, is easy on any stretch of the imagination to have, you, you, you know, because you're very much a kind of discounted, but it's not the case that you don't have opportunities. Um, and so there's, there's, you know, different people are pursuing different strategies. You know, Peter uh, Klein and Nikolai Foss are very mainstream scholars within the field of entrepreneurship studies. So not economics, but in management and entrepreneurship, they still have an academic foot and they're making contributions in that in that area. Um, and uh, so that's that's another area. Per Bylands, another scholar who's working in that area as well. And so you see great progress that some people are making in that um, in, in that field. Um, other people, my one of my former students, Dave Scarbeck, is a tenured professor at Brown. Um, he's won all kinds of awards from the American Political Science Association. He left economics and went into political science, and he finds more opportunities there, right, than he would in economics. But he's very much part of the conversation at the cutting edge of political science. And so, you know, and one last thing that I recommend your readers to look up, those who are academically inclined, is um, going back to your modeling thing and then also this issue about the mainstream is that um, there's a paper circulating around by Brian Author. I, I highly recommend looking it up, just W. Brian Author. He was a professor at Stanford and one of the founders at the Santa Fe Institute. So he's the developer of a complexity modeling in economics. Very, very respected figure. And he has a paper circulating around, it's called uh, Economics for Nouns and Economics for Verbs. And his argument is that standard economics is grounded in economics for nouns, meaning states. 
But what we need in economics is an economics for verbs. And that's about activity. And his argument is that that means the future belongs to Austrian economics because Austrian economists is an economics of activity. Now, I'm not saying that author's prediction is going to come true, but it might come true. And I think also if you look at Paul Romer's Nobel laureate address, which was just a couple of years ago, the year before COVID, I think, hit was when he was the Nobel Prize winner, uh, maybe two years before that. He argues that we need to have a shift in our economics so that we can take into account novelty and creativity. Because we need to have novelty and creativity at the center to understand innovation. Right. And, and if we see that kind of stuff, again, the Austrian kind of approach will have a new, renewed appreciation, I think. So there's there's wedges of opportunities that scholars can pursue to be part of the mainstream conversation and maybe nudge that mainstream conversation back to the main line. And that's the activity that I'm involved in. But it, it ha it's it's long and onerous and. <laughs> very you know it has it has low rates of return because it's just very hard for good reasons it's hard because science is structured to bias against quackery that's a the internet unleashes quackery it's like quackery equality right so every quack gets their opinion and that's okay it's democratization of knowledge science is an elite game science is an elite game only elites get to play the game and, and it's hard to become an elite or be recognized as an elite. And the analogy I would use, you're, you're in Europe, so you don't, you, know, you don't have the same sports that we would have, but soccer or football, as you would call it, is. But not every person that's in the stadium can get on the field and play. And in fact, nor would you want to. So soccer has an amazing winnowing out process as kids go from youth all the way until they play in the – in, in, in you know in the Euro Cup right and so it's brutal <laughs> all that movement like that there's no democratization of soccer right there's there's everyone can get in but you get brutally beat up that's what science is like as well because science as Polanyi taught us has this essential tension your contributions have to be plausible your constitution your contributions um, have to be plausible to the community. Uh, they have to be uh, seen as uh, intrinsically interesting to the community. And then they have to be creative. But interest and plausibility are conservative forces. Creative is a revolutionary force. So there's an essential tension in science. And, the only, and, and science is a set of rules to weed out quackery because that's how science gets debunked. And so... This is this is this game is just a tough one in that. And that's what that's what Murphy's that's that's what, you know, program was saying. Sorry, I, I was going to ask from from the three, um, uh, which which is best, for example, if you had a magic wand and you think that everybody will uh, read and listen, is it better to go in with, like with a book like Freakonomics with the Sowell and the Williams? Uh, you know, books for the regular layman, layperson that can understand, or go to academia and fight with the big, with the big names like Krugman, for example, or then the public policy. Like, which is the best, most rewarding? Let's say, uh, Nick, I don't, I don't know the answer to that because I think it's very <laughs> private to every individual and their calculation. I think you have to be brutally self-aware, but I do believe that. Even the most successful public intellectuals are drawing on the scholarly authority of somebody, yep. right? And and so um, you know. And by the way, that discourse has changed over time. So someone like Adam Smith was talking both to his peers, but also to a broader intelligentsia. All right, but he wasn't writing to the guy, you know like the, the life wasn't the same way. He wasn't appearing on radio shows or, yeah. or, you know, writing op-eds or whatever he, he was, you know, but same thing with mill, like mills writing in a language that can reach everyone. So the interested layman can like become knowledgeable about economics. So, but there, but what they were doing, for example, is different. Let me use an example from the U S what Smith or mill were doing is a lot different from what Hamilton 
and Madison were doing with the Federalist Papers. So the Federalist Papers are trying to sell a set of ideas to the general population about you know, what, a, what a constitution would look like. Whereas the Montesquieu and the other political theorists that they're drawing on, those are, those are people that are more like Smith and Mill. Does that, does that make any sense? So when we think about this, like where does Hamilton or Madison draw their strength from in their ability to sell their ideas? Well, it's from ideas that they got from this refined conversation that was being done, you know, by, by, by these other scholars. So I think you need all three. Uh, in fact, I think you need more than that. I refer to, I tell my graduate students that they should become five tool players. That's an analogy to baseball. So, you know, in baseball, which is this America's pastime, we have, we have these things. Can you run? Can you hit? Can you throw? You know, these kind of things. And can you feel? These are these five tool players. And I say, we want to be a five tool player in, ac in economics. And that is that we can talk to our scientific peers, that we can talk to our students. I think the most important job any economist has that pursues an academic path is their job as a teacher. They need to be really, really good teachers. And then third, they can talk to policymakers by providing sound public policy criticism and analysis. They can talk to the general public and they can be entrepreneurs, meaning they recognize the opportunities to advance the ideas that they care about. And it's those five tool players, and I think to give you an example, I think Ben Powell at Texas Tech University is probably the best five tool player among the younger generation of Austrian economists. Just think about you know, what Ben has been able to accomplish in the way he pursues things. He is a scholar, let's say his most recent book on immigration, The uh, you know, Wretched Refuse um, with Cambridge University Press. Um, think about, you know, uh, his teaching impact, both at Suffolk, at San Jose State, at Suffolk, and now at Texas Tech. He's been a hugely successful professor. Uh, he's been able to publish in top journals in the economics profession. He's uh, able to write and, and produce public policy uh, stuff that he did, especially when he was out in California. He did a lot of that kind of work. And then he's an entrepreneur of an amazing uh, capacity. By the way, he was the one who was successful enough to bring Bob Murphy back into academia. So, you know, Bob Murphy, I tried to get Bob Murphy to come and do a postdoc at GMU, but he didn't want to do that because we're a state university. But, you know, 20 years later, uh, Ben was able to work out a deal for him and Murphy came and worked and did a great job at Texas Tech working with graduate students and talking to them about their work. Um, and, you know, Ben pulled that off. He's an amazing entrepreneur, recognizes talent knows how to, to recruit talent and keep talent. So I would use him as an example of, we need more five tool players like Ben Powell. Uh, well, uh, Professor, that's um, very interesting. And I have like so many questions, but we are very close to the end. And there are a few questions from the audience as well. Sure. But um, I will, for example, skip the one on money and uh, banking because uh, and gold standard of course because we have next week Larry White joining us for exactly that yeah yeah so I will give you t t two questions and you can choose the the yeah. one you prefer one would be hike and road to serve them and whether or how close are we especially during the pandemic with, with that or or what about the Austrian economics in the 21st century as our conference we are doing in November says what are our what is the research of the Austrian school in modern times? So you can you can choose. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick the future in Austrian economics in the 21st century, though I think that the road to serfdom has a lot of important lessons in it. And I would just tell your readers to our listeners to um, look at the chapter called The End of Truth. Uh, the end of truth in, in the road to serfdom. I think it's eerily important and relevant for the world that we live in today. Um, okay, so on, on Austrian economics in the 21st century, I would like to emphasize that there's tremendous opportunities for development in which, again, following my wedge theory, that there's openings in the economics literature that Austrians can join the conversation in. The most obvious one is in development economics. 
So not only the work of Bill Easterly, who has in fact made an impact by utilizing ideas from Hayek in like his book, not only the elusive quest for growth, but the white man's burden and more recently the tyranny of experts. For, re for listeners there, he has a great essay in the Review of Austrian Economics, the journal that I edit. Bill Easterly has a great essay called Adam Smith is Development Economists. It's just great. I can't recommend it highly enough. But it's also the case that Darren Asimoglu and James Robinson in their book, The Narrow Corridor, is also opening up space for people that are of interest in Austrian economics to be able to enter into and converse with them about those issues. So we have development economics is a very important field. Uh, monetary economics, I'll leave to Larry White to talk about, but you know, Raghu Rajan, who is at Chicago and was the central banker of India, he wrote a book called Fault Lines, but he's also written other works where he explicitly draws on Rothbard and other Austrians to try to make and develop his ideas. And so I think there's still room in the theory of capital and developing the idea of the time structure production of heterogeneous multi-specific goods, uh, which, you know, that those kind of models become more the idea that money is not neutral, that money is one half of all exchanges, and therefore money can be distortionary when we screw up monetary policy. There's areas there where the Austrians can, in fact, jump into the mainstream conversation again. Um, they, uh, uh, you know, Basically, this point that I mentioned about Brian Author and the nouns versus verbs and the fundamental models of economics, decision making under uncertainty. There's so many areas that are now economists are opening up to these kind of questions that Mises and Hayek were, were discussing. And just to give your listeners a, a little bit of a, a shift of perspective, think about reading the first hundred pages of Human Action and getting rid in your head of the word apodictic certainty. Like just take that out and don't read the book thinking that it's trying to provide an epistemological foundation, which it is, and I'm not denying that, but think about the problem that he's identifying of the individual chooser. What does it mean to be a human chooser? So the human chooser in Mises' sense, the human chooser, title of the book, human action, Right. <laughs> right. It, 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 it's not homo economicus. It's not maximizing. It can't be because humans aren't maximizers. We strive to do the best that we can given our circumstances, but we're constantly plagued with haunt, haunting fears and alluring hopes. We, as, we are aspiring individuals, which means that we aspire to be something other than what we currently are. OK, so we can't act as if we are just tangently kissing a budget constraint. That, that's not what we do. That's not we, we make decisions under uncertainty. If you make decisions under uncertainty, that highlights the role of these tools that you need. What's one of the most important tools that you need? The ability to engage in economic calculation. Sort from the array of technologically possible those which are economically viable. Well, what's the foundations of that? Property rights, that gets us into a whole thing about property rights again. So do you see how like just understanding decision-making under uncertainty opens up all of our areas of understanding property rights economics, law and economics, decision-making within different contexts, bureaucracy, the voting booth, religious services, all that stuff. And so it just opens up the, the array of possibilities that modern economics can go into and so to me, Austrian economics in the 21st century is a growth industry, not a declining industry. You, 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 you get in now and, per, and, and invest now, right? You don't sell short now. Now's the time to invest. And that means especially young people. We need young, brilliant people that are energetic and excited to engage in this conversation at its highest levels. And that's what I hope to, to support and and give way to yeah well i before leaving uh, remember that professor bradke challenged you to read the wealth of nations after the invisible hand those <laughs> paragraphs are important i would say personally applied mainland economics is something i personally would uh, suggest reading for everybody interested in this topic it's on the on the money 
prof uh, Professor Betke mentioned the F.A. Hayek Economics, Political Economy and Social Philosophy for those interested. And again, uh, the latest book uh, of his is Money and the Rule of Law. Uh, next week on the 9th, if I'm not mistaken, at 6 p.m., we are having Larry White for an interview about the present, the past, and the future of money. Yeah. And again, don't remember, the, there are like still almost 20 days for the papers to be written and sent to us for the Austrian conference. And um, hope I will see many of you in Vienna in November. And with that, I would like to thank uh, Professor Betke for joining us today. Um, for this awesome discussion, I would say, from at least from my side. <laughs> yeah, well, I greatly appreciate it. And I hope that if anyone out there in the listening land would, would uh, like to have follow up, just tell them to email me and, and follow up. I, I will try to answer their questions. I, uh, uh, this, is where, this is where the unanswered questions come, come into play. So you, you can contact Professor Betke and he will, as he said, will try to answer them. Yeah. So thank you, and until next week, stay safe. Thank you. I hope that was okay, Simon. <laughs> oh.